Events at Fukushima reinforce that any nuclear accident with public health and safety or environmental consequences of that magnitude is inherently unacceptable. While we focused on the radiological consequences of this event, I believe we can, cannot ignore the large social and economic consequences such an event poses to any country with a nuclear facility that deals with such a crisis. In Japan, more than 90,000 people remain displaced from their homes and land, with some having little prospect for a return to their previous lifestyle in the foreseeable future. While not easy to characterize, these are significant hardships on these people, and they are inherently unacceptable. So as we look to the future, and we look in a proactive way, we ultimately will have to address the issue of how we deal with, with nuclear events that lead to significant land contamination and displacement, perhaps permanently, of people from their homes and their livelihoods and their communities. What you just heard was the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's chairman, Gregory Yasko, saying that the NRC doesn't take into account mass evacuations and people not getting back on their land for centuries when it does a cost-benefit analysis as to whether or not a nuclear plant should be licensed. I'm Arnie Gunderson from Fairwinds and today I'm at the Regulatory Information Conference put on by the NRC in Washington DC. So today I'm in Washington DC. A couple weeks ago though I was in Tokyo and when I was in Tokyo, I took some samples. Now, I didn't look for the highest radiation spot. I just went around with five plastic bags. And when I found an area, I just scooped up some dirt and put it in the bag. One of those samples was from a crack in the sidewalk. Another one of those samples was from a children's playground that had been previously decontaminated. Another sample had come from some moss on the side of the road. Another sample came from a, um, um, the, the roof of an office building that I was at. And the last sample was right across the street from the main judicial center in downtown Tokyo. Well, I brought those samples back, declared them through customs, and sent them to the lab. And the lab determined that all of them would be qualified as radioactive waste here in the United States and would have to be shipped to Texas to be disposed of. Now think about the ramifications for the nation's capital, whether it's Tokyo or the United States. How would you like it if you went to pick your flowers and were kneeling in radioactive waste? That's what's happening in Tokyo now. And I think that's the point that Chairman Yasko was trying to make. When the Nuclear Regulatory Commission does its cost-benefit analyses now, it doesn't take into account the cost to society if you have to evacuate for generations or if you have to move 100,000 people, perhaps forever. There's 100 miles between us and about a dozen nuclear power plants here in Washington, D.C. Fukushima was almost 200 miles away from Tokyo. And yet Tokyo soil, in some places, the ones I just happened to find, would qualify as radioactive waste here in the States. How would we feel if our nation's capital were contaminated to that degree? So I agree with Chairman Yasko. New nukes and old nukes that are being relicensed should include as a cost in their analysis what we've learned to be happening in Tokyo and in Japan. The countdown has begun to the 2020 Tokyo Olympic and Paralympic Games. It is half a century since the last Tokyo Games in 1964, showcasing the nation's rapid post-war growth. So what is the message that Japan, now a developed country, wants to send to the world in 2020? I spoke with Toshiro Muto, Chief Executive Officer of the Tokyo Organizing Committee. Muto wants to create a successful sports festival, but he's also conscious of the legacy that the games will bequeath to the next generation. How do you plan to make the 2020 games different from 1964?
The 1964 Olympics were hugely important in showcasing Japan's re-emergence on the international stage. The vital legacy has been the physical infrastructure built then, such as the Shinkansen bullet train and highways. For 2020, I'd like to put more weight on the softer legacies of the games. Muto says one example of this legacy is urban development, considerate to the needs of the elderly and disabled. The Paralympics will draw delegations and groups from across the globe. Tokyo will be the first city to host the Paralympics twice. We're placing a lot of emphasis on this, so the city must be barrier-free, or in other words, universally designed. For example, a review is already ongoing in many parts of the city. That includes the route from the Tokyo International Airport to the Olympic Village to see if it is possible to do this in a wheelchair. Urban development based on universal design will definitely be a big theme. Islamic extremist groups have launched a string of terrorist attacks in various countries. With Japan also now on the target list, Muto says intensifying security is vital. We promoted Tokyo as a safe city, and in fact it still is considered the safest city in the world by many standards. But when thinking about the future, we might not be able to proclaim that so optimistically anymore. Terrorist attacks may actually happen in Japan, so we must put our best efforts into security. That includes cybersecurity. The London Games reportedly experienced more than 200 million cyber attacks. Tokyo might experience the same or worse. We have to develop the world's most advanced cybersecurity technology to cope. Government, business, and we ourselves must take special efforts to reach that level. The economic legacy of this technology will become important as well. Muto thinks recovery from the Great East Japan earthquake in 2011 should be another Olympic legacy. Many people want to connect the coming Olympics with the recovery from the disaster of 2011. How would you like to link these two together? I believe that recovery from the Great East Japan earthquake is an important perspective. There are still people abroad who vividly remember footage of the tsunami and have doubts about holding the Olympics in a country that has been so affected by disaster. So it's extremely important to show the world how Japan has rebuilt. People have asked us if special consideration can be given to the disaster-stricken areas during the Olympic torch relay. We've had requests to invite athletes from abroad to the three worst hit prefectures and use these areas for training camps or for practice or to adjust to Japan's climate and time difference. If the people in the disaster hit areas are encouraged by seeing athletes and if this can be another step towards recovery, it would be an important effect for the Olympics. The games will attract many foreign visitors. Muto wants them to enjoy the games and return home with some of Japan's charm in their heart. Japanese culture contains both traditional and contemporary aspects, such as anime created by the young. Hospitality is also another part of this culture. If these are communicated to the world, it could lead to a re-evaluation of Japan. That will attract repeat foreign visitors who want to experience Japanese culture again. If signs and digital directions for foreign visitors were installed in every part of Japan so they wouldn't get lost, more people will be able to visit. They would go back home and tell their families and friends what a wonderful place Japan is. They'd talk about it for the rest of their lives. These are the kind of people 
who will serve as the best goodwill ambassadors. I don't want the 2020 Olympics to end as just a festival. What if the games shaped minds and left an impression on the young? People will look back on 2020 and remember what a wonderful year it was. That would be amazing. I'm Christopher Busby. I'm a, a, an expert on the health effects of ionizing radiation. And I want to talk to you about um, Fukushima and Chernobyl. Um, what I want to say is, about, uh, is, is, to, is that uh, the, the models that are used to determine the effects of radiation always concentrate on cancer and leukemia. And so the current risk model will say how many cancers are expected after Fukushima and how many cancers were expected after Chernobyl and so forth. But we know from Chernobyl that radiation causes a whole range of diseases and, and one of the diseases that it seems to cause is heart disease. I want to talk to you about heart disease effects in children. Now a colleague of mine, Professor Yuri Bandashevsky, d uh, became quite famous um, because he studied the effects of cesium-137 exposure to children in the areas that were contaminated by, um, by the Chernobyl accident in Belarus. Uh, he discovered, uh, in the late 90s, he discovered um, that the children who were contaminated to the extent of having a, only 20 to 30 becquerels per kilogram, which is not very much, of cesium-137, were suffering cardiac arrhythmias, that, that that's, uh, the, the heart wasn't, wasn't beating properly, um, and they were suffering heart attacks and dying. And it's a very serious matter. So it wasn't a question of leukemia and cancer in these children, although that occurred as well, but there were very high rates of heart disease in these children. So the children were manifesting um, heart diseases which are normally only found in old people. And this got me thinking about how this could be at, at what appears to be quite a low level of contamination. So I started looking into this and what I found is truly extraordinary, which I shall share it with you. The, the, the heart of a child is, is um, at the age of about two, or, uh, uh, two to five is, quite, is, is, is about this size. And at, at the age of about ten it's about this size. And we know from measurements that have been made how many cells there are in the heart of a child. A five-year-old child has a, has a heart which is approximately 220 grams in weight. Uh, a lot of it, of course, is, is blood. So if you take the blood out and just you leave the muscle tissue, there's about 85 grams of muscle tissue in, in the heart of a child aged five. This is all data. Now, we actually know also the size of, of, of the, heart, um, the heart muscle cells. So we know how many heart muscle cells there are. In, in a child's heart. There are, about, there are about 3 billion muscle cells in a child's heart. So this is a number, 3 billion. And what we can do is we can put 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium in a thought experiment. We can put it into this heart muscle. And a becquerel uh, is one disintegration per second. So we can see how many disintegrations, uh, that's how many electron tracks uh, come from, from this cesium-137 in a period of about a year. And when we do this sum, and it's really simple, it can be done on the back of an envelope, what we find is that there are many, many more electron tracks tra traversing the cells than you can imagine. And in fact, it works out that if only 1% of those cells were, da were, were killed by the electron tracks from that level of cesium-137, if only 1% were killed, you would lose 25% of all the muscle cells in the heart. This is very serious because the heart is an extraordinary organ. The muscle cells in the heart are autonomous. They just contract and they contract and they contract for the whole period of the life of the individual. And every day they pump 7,000 litres of blood through the body. Truly extraordinary. And we live for 70 years. So this heart beats away continuously for the whole of your lifespan. But of course these cells are non-replaceable by and large. It turns out that, that, that only 1% of these cells can be replaced in a year. So if these cells get damaged, or if a particular number of these cells get damaged, they cannot be replaced in a short period of time. So, so a year's exposure to 50 becquerels per kilogram of cesium-137, and incidentally, uh, cesium-137, we know from experiments, binds to muscle. So this is where it goes, just like iodine goes into the thyroid gland, and strontium goes into the bone and it goes to the DNA. 
cesium-137 goes to muscle, so it will concentrate in the muscle tissue of the heart. So this child's heart, after one year of, of, of exposure to that level of cesium, which is quite a small level, will have approximately 25% of its cells destroyed. Now, we would therefore expect to find effects, and the same effects that were found by Bandashevsky. And it does seem, from, from what people have been telling me about children in, in the Fukushima-affected area, that they are actually suffering heart attacks. So, there are two things that follow from this, which are terribly important. The first thing is that children in that area should immediately be scanned using ECG, electrocardiograms. All hospitals have these devices to see whether they have conduction problems because, because the first manifestation of this damage to the heart muscle cell will be conduction problems which can be shown on these ECGs and in fact this is how Bandashevsky uh, found this and incidentally Bandashevsky when he reported this was sent to jail and uh, the, the government wouldn't believe it and they said he was scaremongering and so they sent him to jail he was in jail for several years until eventually Amnesty International and the European Commission the European Parliament uh, issued him with an international passport, one of only 25 that have ever been issued, and got him out of jail. So I work quite closely with Bandashevsky, who is a hero. He, he received the Edward P. Radford Memorial Prize for Radiation uh, Biology uh, at the, the Lesbos Conference, um, where he gave this paper that, that showed that these in, there were these increases in the, in the heart disease in the children. So the first thing that has to be done is that the children have to be checked out for conduction problems with an ECG. Evacuated. And if, if yes, and, the, and of course, if any of them are suffering from these problems, they should be immediately evacuated. But if they, any of them are suffering from these problems, then all of the children should be evacuated because it means that there will be subclinical effects from this cesium-137 in heart muscle. And it will not be repaired. Heart cannot be repaired. Heart tissue cannot be repaired. These children will suffer for the whole of their life and will die young. Which brings me to the second point. The second point is this, is that if you die from heart attack or heart disease, you will not die from cancer. Because cancer is essentially a disease of old, pe old people. So you get genetic damage and it goes on and on and on. Eventually you get cancer. By and large, what happens is that the cancer rates go up very sharply as you get old. But I can tell you this, that the heart disease effects go up very much more quickly. So what you will find in areas like Fukushima that are contaminated with these radionuclides is not necessarily an enormous increase in cancer. There will be an increase in cancer, but you will find a big increase in heart disease. And actually what we look, when we look at Belarus, we find both of those things. We find an increase in cancer, but we find a big increase in heart disease, an enormous increase in heart disease. And as a result of this, the demogra demographic index of the Republic of Belarus has fallen sharply after the Chernobyl accident and now has gone into negative replacement. So in fact if it goes on like this the, the, the population of Belarus will disappear. And this is what we will expect to see in Fukushima. So I'm warning you all now to start looking out for heart disease, heart attacks and keep getting the children out of there quickly. This is all simple stuff. You can do these calculations and I've done these calculations and I've produced a report which will be put on the internet shortly and that you can, you can have a look at. And we have also, the European Committee on Radiation Risk has also released early the Bandashevsky paper that he gave at the Lesbos Conference, and that is on the website of the European Committee on, of, of Radiation Risk, which is www.uradcom.org, E-U-R-A-D-C-O-M. So thank you for listening.